Welcome to the fourth installment of History Bites of 2022. My name is Anna Patterson and I'm a visitor experience assistant here at Guelph Museums. History Bites is a one hour long casual conversation during which we chat about the latest news, exhibitions, and other happenings at Guelph Museums. Today I'm going to be sharing some fascinating fashion facts and we're also going to be having a chat with our collections intern Rebecca Clark about her new exhibit The Origin of Fan. History Bites airs on Facebook Live at noon on the third Wednesday of every month. A recording of today's History Bites will be available through the Museum Everywhere portal and on our website and on our socials after the broadcast. Guelph is located on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The place we now call Guelph is on land that is described in the Between the Lakes Purchase No. 3 Treaty of 1792, an agreement between the Mississaugas of the Credit and the British Crown concerning over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario, and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nation Inuit and Métis peoples. Guelph Museums commits to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to doing more to learn, share, and support truth and healing. When we gather, we spend time in conversation about the land, its history, and its peoples. We continue to grow our knowledge and our relationships with our treaty partner, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and with many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples who call Guelph home. This informs all that we do here at the museum and underscores our commitments to each other today and for the health and well-being of future generations. So today we are doing another installment of In the Vaults, uh, a History Bite series where we take a look at some of the fascinating artifacts that call Guelph Museums home. And we are focusing today on probably my favorite uh, topic in history, which is fashion. Uh, the reason that I love fashion so much isn't just because they're beautiful to look at and they're aesthetically pleasing, but because it is such a concrete way uh, to get to know the people who wore the items. Um, it's a really tangible way to access history and the stories of the people uh, who lived here. So what I've decided to do is go as far back as our collection allows us to do. Um, and I've chosen two dresses. The first is our uh, oldest complete uh, gown um, and it dates from circa 1840 and we're going to be taking a look at that. It is a blue silk ribbon dress um, and then I've also chosen another dress. Um, it's from a little bit later. It's from uh, circa 1875 to about 1885 um, and it is a beautiful taffeta plaid dress. Um, and I've chosen these two dresses because I think they are incredible examples of not only the fashion of the time, but how fashion was interpreted for real living people and their lives and needs. Um, and they're connected to people that we actually know about here in Guelph. So these two dresses we're going to take a look at are stunningly beautiful, but we're not only going to take a look at the dresses, we're also going to take a look at what might go underneath those dresses. So we're going to take a look at all of the foundational garments uh, and even accessories that go with those dresses uh, that would be appropriate to the time periods. One of the accessories we are going to take a look at is the fan, and this was a very essential accessory for many, many decades. Uh, and fortunately, we have uh, an expert on the fan now. We have Rebecca Clark, uh, who is a collections intern here at Guelph Museums, and she has recently uh, installed her exhibit, The Origin of Fan. And so Rebecca's gonna talk a little bit about some of the fans from the time periods we're looking at. So from about 1840 to about 18. 1880, and we'll see what kinds of fans might have gone with the dresses that we're going to be taking a look at. Now both of the dresses that we're going to be taking a look at today are in excellent condition. They are very, very beautiful with honestly very few signs of wear on them, uh, which actually tells us a little bit about the dress and the purpose of the dress. Um, but it also helps us to um, give us an opportunity to explore how museums end up with fashion in their collections and what that fashion actually means. So often we only see the most beautiful examples um, and the most stunning dresses that have survived. 
it's very rare that we actually have fashion that's being collected from people who were uh, working class, um, especially in areas um, like Guelph, where during this time period in the 1840s, it still would have been very much a rural um, town and not a bustling metropolis like somewhere uh, like York or London or Paris at the time. So quite often museums end up with only the peak of the fashion. So we end up with these incredible examples of the height of fashion from a particular decade or year or uh, fashion trend um, without really considering the fact that trends would have changed relatively slowly and that not everyone would be wearing uh, the height of fashion the moment that it came out. It would be typically slow transitions. You would maybe alter an older dress um, with a few little details to uh, bring it up into um, the trends of the day. And these dresses were ones that people didn't need to worry about continuing to wear um, for a long period of time. And so that's why they are so well preserved. They weren't dresses that were handed down um, from person to person, generation to generation, until they were threadbare and could no longer be worn. They were dresses of the middle upper class um, and women who weren't certainly weren't uh, working in situations like factories um, or in domestic households. They would have been um, the wealthier classes who could afford to purchase new dresses. Um, and so that's something that's really important to keep in mind when we are thinking about fashion history um, and especially about fashion in museum collections that they um, represent a very specific class of uh, person in a specific time period and can't necessarily be extrapolated to assume that everyone was wearing the exact same thing. There's also a very natural bias that happens and so we get this impression that everyone was beautifully dressed to the nines in silks and taffetas and laces when in fact that's, those are the only dresses that have, survi have survived because the people who owned them were able to preserve them and didn't have to continue to wear them. Um, and so that is why we end up with these very beautiful gowns, very high class gowns, um, and not a lot of working class wear. So I would like um, everyone to cite, kind of keep that in the back of their minds as we're taking a look at the dresses that um, these are really good examples of some of the trends over the decades um, that we're going to be looking at in what would have been the early period of Guelph's history, um, but that it certainly wouldn't have been what everybody was wearing on the streets of Guelph. There would have been a lot more variety um, in the, the quality of the fabric, the styles, the silhouettes, um, and what people could afford uh, to wear. So these are really just the, the peak examples, but uh, they would certainly not be common to everybody. So the first dress that we're going to talk about in this series is this beautiful hand-sewn blue silk ribbon dress. This dress is from the 1840s and is, as far as I can tell, the oldest complete gown that we have in our collection. It is absolutely beautiful. It's probably my new favorite dress that we have. I say that about all the dresses, um, but I do really, really love this one. I believe that it's called a silk ribbon dress because, um, in our records at least, because of the silk detailing at the front here, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, because although the rest of it does kind of look like ribbons, it is a solid um, uh, design in the fabric, although the fabric has been cut in ways, especially around here, to emphasize the shape of the, of the bodice and of the skirt uh, to create the silhouette of the time. Uh, but this dress is really beautiful, and I think it gives us an opportunity to explore um, time, uh, sort of fashion that was typical of the time, but also typical of the way fashion changed and developed. Because although we see in um, textbooks or museums or what have you, examples of um, the peak fashion of the time period, Typically, a dress like this would have been worn for more than just a year. There was, this was long before fast fashion. And so often dresses would have to have different elements that would um, sort of carry on its wearability. For instance, the swooping neckline was very common and very popular in the 1830s. Uh, the elongated torso is more reminiscent of the 1840s. And so 
what I love about this dress is that it really does show this combination of trends and tastes and the fact that it wasn't a um, a hard and fast rule in between typical styles, typical silhouettes of time periods. So I think that this is a really beautiful example of that. And we'll see some of the ways in which the original owner of the dress would have been able to sort of update it and make some small adjustments to make sure that it was still within sort of the, the current trend, the current fashion, and yet um, they were able to still get a lot of use and a lot of wear out of this dress. So let's dive into some of the individual aspects of this dress. So the style of the bodice is really emblematic of the time period. Because you have this transitional period in between different shapes and different silhouettes. So the top of the bodice, we still have this really wide shoulder uh, neckline and uh, the way that we have it pinned on the mannequin is really where it was meant to sit. So it was meant to sit right on the edges of the shoulders. Um, and at this time, this is likely more of a day dress. An evening dress may have actually come down even a little bit further um, on the shoulders. But the thing about this dress that makes it so um, typical of its time period is really the pointed bodice. So this whole section of the dress comes down into a, um, into a low deep point here. Um, and really all of the decoration that's on the bodice is meant to draw the eye to this feature. Um, it, everything about this is meant to accentuate um, the tininess of the waist. Um, and of course, remember that um, this lady who was in this dress uh, would naturally not have had this shape to her body. Um, it would have been aided um, and supported by all of her undergarments, which we'll definitely take a look at, um, especially a corset. Um, but it was all to create this um, very, uh, um, very distinct silhouette of having a tiny, tiny waist, drawing attention to the wider shoulders and the wider skirt. So we have the, um, the way that this is cut on the bias uh, creates these lines that draw, again, attention down into the curve, into the pointedness of the bodice. And we also have the ladder. Of the uh, of the little bows that are here along with all of the piping along all of the seams the shoulders are also set um, way down here so the shoulders the natural shoulders are here but the shoulder of where the uh, sleeve is connected to the dress is much lower at this time period and this would be pretty restraining um, it wouldn't give you a lot of options for for instance raising your arms um, and things like that but that wasn't really a concern with this style of dress that's not what it was for. Um, the bodice is also made up of several pieces of silk. So it's not just, you know, a front and a back. We have uh, seams along here, under the arms, and then around the back that come down into a point. The style of this dress, again, is really interesting because of the fact that fashion didn't change overnight. Um, and so you would have these transitional periods where there would be elements from previous decades um, transitioning into newer silhouettes. So for instance, this one um, does have that swooping bodice um, that is more reminiscent of the 1830s, but it also has um, a lot of elements of romanticism that was very common in the 1830s. And so even though this dress is from the 1840s, it still has a lot of those elements. Uh, for instance, the fabric is very um, light in color. We have these decorative um, uh, floral patterns. Um, and so these stripes, these flowers are very much part of Romanticism. Um, and in Romanticism in the 1830s, there were a lot of sort of throwbacks to earlier periods, especially the 18th century. And so another feature of this dress is the line of bows here along the front. And it's meant to sort of mimic the look of a stomacher from the 18th century, from the dresses that would be laced in the front and you would have a separate piece in the front. And this is a term, this sort of ladder of bows um, is referred to as Seychelles. Uh, and so this is another element of that romanticism that would harken back to an earlier period, but also have the more modern silhouette of the 1840s in the very long, elongated torso uh, that culminates in that peaked uh, or pointed bodice uh, down here. The color of the silk, uh, the pattern, all is very... Um, 
uh, reminiscent of the 1830s um, and yet in this newer silhouette. So the skirt of this dress is also an extremely good example of the fashion of the time period uh, because of the way that it's constructed and the way that it would be shaped when worn. So the dress uh, is, it is one piece, um, but the skirt, the way that it's being sewn is pleated right along the waist, which would create this uh, sort of dome effect. Um, once it was worn over top of petticoats. So this dress was actually before the period of the very wide um, hoop skirts or the hooped crinolines um, and the, the cage hoops, the bustles. It's a little bit earlier than that. And so all of the, um, all of the volume that you would want with this skirt would be created by petticoats and so you would be wearing layers and layers of petticoats. Some of those petticoats might be stiffened or a little bit thicker to hold out the dress but it wouldn't be from a sort of wired contraption underneath the dress. It would just be from layers of fabric um, and so the pleating along the dress really helps to do that. The skirt was also made out of more than one piece of fabric, um, or even more than two panels. It would be typically made out of several panels. Um, and this one is just like that, made up of many panels that would be then sewn together. And ideally, when you're sewing them together, you would do it in such a way as that there was not a center seam on the dress that would be seen. And this one, if you do check, we do have to kind of move the bow out of the way but there is no center seam. So this one was done pretty well, although it wouldn't make too much of a difference because we do have this beautiful ribbon on it um, that has been added that would have covered a seam. Interestingly, the ribbon that is attached to the Seychelles on the bodice um, has been a later addition. Um, so it is, although it looks very, very similar to the pattern on the dress, it is a slightly different floral pattern, um, which is interesting and not immediately um, apparent, but it does have, uh, the whole skirt does have that uh, voluminous effect. And so the silhouette that would be really um, the goal here with this dress is a dome. So not um, sort of smaller with a very, um, very sort of wide bustle at the back, um, not sort of wide like the previous court dresses, um, but more of a dome. Apparently, um, this dome shape, especially with all the petticoats, probably would have been warm and especially in places like um, Upper Canada would have been useful in that sense. Um, but apparently it was difficult to walk in and there are recounts of women saying that um, later on that the crinolines of the, 19, or the 1850s and 60s were actually more comfortable um, to walk in and wear because it held the fabric away from the legs and you didn't kind of get caught up and tripped. Um, but I imagine the warmth would have been appreciated, but it would have all been created by that. And so when we're looking at this dress, uh, it is a little bit hard to imagine, but she probably would be uh, not of a dissimilar height to myself because we do have her up so that the, um, the skirt isn't resting on the floor to protect it. Um, but it would have been at the time and it wouldn't have fallen as smoothly down to the ground like this. It would have been quite puffed out with the petticoats, um, which means that she probably would have been shorter than the mannequin here would suggest. Um, so I like to think she probably would have been about my height, but I could be mistaken. So another interesting feature of this dress is that it has this additional piece in the form of a jacket. Um, and I would guess that in terms of wear, this one looks a little bit more faded, a little bit more worn than the bodice that would go underneath that's attached to the skirt. And so I think this was actually used a lot more than it maybe was just without. Um, and I'm going to put it on because it does have some interesting features. So pieces like this would be really great ways to update a dress, an existing dress, for modern trends. So we saw the other bodice underneath that had the very wide neck, it had um, the elongated torso and bodice, the Seychelles along the front that were reminiscent of the 1830s. As soon as we put the jacket on, um, it has sort of a twofold purpose. Of course, this one has long sleeves, so naturally would probably be a little bit warmer, but also it does update the dress a bit. And so this is a little bit more common of the 1840s where you have the higher neckline, um, you still have the very elongated torso, 
Um, but instead of having the Seychelles creating the pattern, it's the actual, it's the folds and the patterns in the fabric itself and the way that the dress has been pleated that creates the dimension um, and the interest in detail in the dress rather than adding additional elements like bows and things like that. It does also still have the very low cut shoulders. So again, it would be um, something that wouldn't be very flexible. But again, not really the point of this particular dress. Um, it also, the way that the shoulder and shoulder seams are cut and the back is cut, it would naturally be um, something that would fit on someone who was in a corseted torso a little bit better. So rather than sort of a natural um, sloping shoulder or a little bit hunched over like a lot of us are today, um, it would really be meant to fit someone who is pulled back and is structured into that corset already. Um, and so your shoulder, you do see the shoulder seams and the back seams um, sitting a lot further back than in modern clothing. Um, the dress does still have a little bow at the back here, um, just at the back of the uh, of, of where it would close in the back to do up. The closures are also all hook and eye closures and they are also all hand sewn. This also has, the jacket has small ties, little cotton um, ties here with additional hook and eye fasteners. And that would be to do up around the waist to stop it from separating. Um, because it was, although it was two separate pieces, it was meant to look like one cohesive garment. Um, and so you would see um, possibly a little bit of the bows here. And it's interesting because you can actually see more wear um, on these, um, on the bows that are lower down than higher up. And that's because this bodice, as well as the one underneath, um, is itself boned. So it's very stiff um, and it has the additional structure in it. And so it would wear here, but it would have these ties to keep it in place. Now I will say, possibly my favorite feature of this dress is its pocket. Uh, so this would be a pocket, now we complain about <laughs> women's clothing today having pockets that are much too shallow, much too small. This one is very small, very shallow. In fact, you likely can't even see it very well. We will do a close up. Um, we have a tiny opening here, right where the bodice and the skirt connect. And it's a little opening, I would say no more than an inch wide. Um, and this would be where you would maybe keep a timepiece, where you would have a little pocket watch, and so the actual pocket is underneath and it really blends in. In fact, it wasn't until um, we were taking the dress out of storage and putting it on the mannequin that we even realized underneath that it had this pocket. So that was a very exciting discovery for the dress. But it is very um, practical to have this second piece, this second jacket to go over top of this dress. It meant that this could be used for more than one occasion and that the style would still be relevant as time went on. Um, because of course this would be a dress owned by someone who was fairly fashionable, fairly stylish, um, and would want to be up to date with trends. Um, and yet you maybe wouldn't want to or maybe wouldn't be able to afford to update a dress or get a new dress with every passing trend. So having this jacket that can go over top of the existing one um, is very, very practical. So as I said before, one of my favorite elements of this dress, possibly my most favorite element, is the tiny little pocket that has been sewn in here along the waistband. So you can see it really does blend in. If we kind of tuck it under a little bit, and especially if we were to have the jacket over top, it would be completely camouflaged uh, within the waistline of the dress. And so it doesn't detract from this uh, conical shape that comes down into the point, but it does add this incredible element of practicality to the dress. So it's a very narrow opening. All I can really get in is my finger. Um, and even then I can only get in really to the first knuckle and I wouldn't try to force it any further at all. Um, but it is quite sturdy because of all of the pleating that has been done along here. So really this pocket would be used um, for really just holding a pocket watch um, to clip it in. Maybe you could fit a key in there if you needed to, but that's pretty much it. Today maybe a lipstick, uh, but that's really all that would go in there. But what was really exciting was that when myself and Laura were pulling this dress out to put on the mannequin, we actually had no idea that it had this little pocket. Um, it's not mentioned in the, uh, in the collection record, and again, it is essentially invisible from the front. 
uh, but we had to take a look at the inside to see the way that the dress was constructed in order to safely put it on the mannequin. And while we were doing that, we noticed a little sewn um, inner pocket on this side and then realized that there must be an opening on the front. And sure enough, we found it and found the pocket. Uh, and so that was a very, very exciting discovery uh, because we all know that dresses are better with pockets. Uh, and so this dress uh, would be uh, very practical in addition to being very fashionable. So what would you have worn with this dress? Well, in addition to the uh, petticoats that we've already seen, you would have worn underneath a set of drawers and a chemise, or possibly even what was called a combination, which is pretty much what it says on the label. It is a combination of a chemise and um, a set of drawers, but it is one uh, garment. Um, and then, of course, you would have had multiple layers of petticoats underneath um, that, so not just, or above that, rather. Now, the chemise and the drawers would have gone underneath the corset, which is a common misconception you see in uh, fashion on TV, uh, but that was for comfort, for practicality, and for lots of reasons. Unfortunately, we don't have any corsets from this time period that survive in our collection. And what accessories would have gone with this dress? Well, you probably would have had um, a silk or a, a scarf, um, a shawl of some sort to keep warm. You may have had some calf skin shoes like these here. Uh, and of course, you would have had something to cover your head. You would have had likely a bonnet or a hat. Uh, bonnets were particularly fashionable during this time period. So we are going to jump ahead a few decades in the fashion history timeline now. We've finished talking about our 1840s gown behind me here, and now we're going to turn our attention to this beautiful gown uh, from circa 1880. And as you can see, it is a beautiful uh, green, red, and purple taffeta plaid gown. Uh, I love this dress because it really demonstrates the vividness and the brightness of the clothing from the time period. Uh, there's a sort of strange phenomenon where because all of the photos from this time period are black and white, we sort of have a dour image of Victorians um, and that they lived in this sort of sepia world of black and white. but. Uh, this is an incredible example of just how much color there was, and color in clothing especially. Um, and so I really uh, adore this dress for that reason. Um, it is important to kind, of, to kind of keep in mind as we're taking a look at this 1880s dress, that it is going to be similar to some of the challenges that we saw with the 1840s dress, um, only in the sense that we're going to see elements that were maybe popular at different time periods between about 1875 to the late 1880s. And again, that's likely because this dress would have been worn for um, maybe a length of time, or it maybe would have been adopted later or earlier in the sort of fashion trend timeline. So plaid was a really popular pattern around this time, um, and it has often been attributed to Queen Victoria. Uh, Queen Victoria dictated so many trends and fashions throughout the Victorian era, um, from her uh, famously wearing black after the death of her husband until the rest of her, uh, for the rest of her life, um, to uh, the common idea that she popularized the white wedding dress. Um, people at the time really looked to the royal families of Europe, um, and especially here in Canada, looking to the royal families of, uh, of England um, to get their inspiration for fashion and for fashion trends. Um, they were the influencers of their day, if you will. And around this time, Queen Victoria was spending a lot of time in Scotland. Her Balmoral home uh, was incredibly uh, beloved by her and her family, and she was known to wear tartan um, when visiting Scotland. And so there was this trickle-down effect where tartan and plaid patterns became very, very popular patterns uh, to the point where this one is a, um, a taffeta for a gown rather than um, in a wool or for a kilt or something like that. Um, 
So this really highlights the popularity of the pattern from that time period, but we'll see some different elements that maybe could date this dress a little later or a little bit earlier. It's difficult to tell exactly. Now with this dress, we do also know exactly who owned it. We know that it was owned by the Stone family here in Guelph. Um, and if you're familiar with Guelph, you'll be familiar with Stone Road and Stone Road Mall, and those are the same stones. They were a very wealthy early Guelph family, um, and we actually have a number of their clothes. Um, and again, as we talked about earlier, that's because they didn't have the need to continuously wear their clothes for as long as they possibly could. They were wealthy enough to be able to afford new clothes as they needed them or with the changing trends and fashions and silhouettes of the time period. Now having examples of dresses like this give us an opportunity to really take a look at how the dress is constructed and how the different parts of the dress are constructed. So this dress has been dated to around 1880s, and that is after um, a very popular look of the late 17 or of the late 1870s into maybe some of the early 1880s, um, which was called um, a princess line or princess silhouette, um, and that was typically achieved either through. Um, uh, one single garment, so it wouldn't have been a bodice and skirt to make a gown, it would have been one piece, or if it was separate pieces, um, the bodice would go much lower down over the hips, and that would create a really long line. We don't see that in this dress, um, and so because it is this, this two piece, we're able to open up the bodice and take a look at how it is actually constructed, which is always fascinating to me. So I'm going to come around to the other side. And so one of the common features of, um, of dresses at the time um, were hook and eye fasteners. Um, and that is, um, for instance, up here at the collar, um, which is a high standing collar. And this was very popular in the 1880s. We have this little fastener here. And we'll do a little bit of a close up of those fasteners. Um, and they would connect into a small slit in the fabric or perhaps a little loop of thread and they would just hold um, the different pieces of the dress in place or the fabric in place. So if we open up the dress or the bodice, um, we see that it actually has two closures. So it has this beautiful row of uh, black buttons on the inside and so that would hold the bodice closed. Um, this mannequin uh, is not corseted, so she's not, we're not quite able to do up the buttons. We won't force it though. Um, and, uh, and so you would first do up the buttons, and then along the outer edge here of this piece of fabric, we have those hook and eye fasteners again. And those would go right into these little um, sort of uh, threads here that would then hold the front closed. Um, and then that would create sort of what was referred to as a false front. Um, the other uh, interesting aspect of the bodice and the construction of the bodice is the fact that it actually has this belt. So this, first of all, this purple ribbon here um, does go over top. There's a little rosette uh, decoration on the side. And that would also help to draw attention to the cut of the dress. But I'm going to just lower it a little bit so that we can see inside here. There's this belt, and this belt also has hook and eye fasteners, and it would be um, designed to hold the bodice close to the body. So rather than it, um, or to create that hourglass look, to create that um, the tight bodice, um, even uh, sort of bringing the, the, the tightness of the princess line into this decade, um, this would have served that purpose. And again, we have the hook and eye fasteners here um, that would have closed this. So another interesting feature of the belt on this dress is that it actually has a maker's mark inside. And the maker's mark identifies it as uh, Lewis and Allenby. Um, and they were a silk merchant in London um, during the 1800s. And what's difficult to say is whether this dress was made by them, they did make clothing, or if the materials for the dress were purchased uh, through Lewis and Allenby 
and then handmade um, or if they had made it themselves. So it's difficult to tell, um, but it is really interesting to have that maker's mark. And again, it actually has um, by, uh, by royal appointment. And so they were a supplier uh, to the queen, to the royal family. And so um, even if the dress wasn't made by them, if the materials came from them, that would be a very um, uh, a high achievement, high status item to own uh, by the Stone family. The other interesting thing about the bodice is the fact that it is actually weighted. So at the front, where it closes, I'm just going to do that back up again. Right down here, where it closes, there are two weights. And that would help to hold the bodice down, hold it flat, um, and stop it from, uh, from separating, from rising up, or anything. And actually, if I turn um, this dress, We'll turn her to the side a little bit, and we're not getting the full um, the full effect of the dress because we don't have the mannequin bustled either. Um, but this would come out, and again, the tails here of the bodice, which would sit um, much higher than they currently are, they would sit on top of a of a a, a bustle pad or a dress improver. Um, but they actually have each a weight at each corner here, a little lead weight that's sewn inside the dress, so you can't see it at all, but that would hold, help to hold it down, hold it flat, and maintain this, uh, this really sleek silhouette. Now, we've been saying bustle colloquially quite a lot during this presentation, uh, but it is important to note that bustle was not a term to be used in polite society at the time. Um, the more proper, more decent terms would have been uh, dress improver, or tournure, um, and that would refer to the device that was worn around the waist and would puff out the, uh, the back of the skirt. Um, and during what is sort of referred to as the bustle era, there were definitely three um, phases of that. Um, this dress seems to date from um, possibly the third bustle uh, decade, so towards the end of the 1800s. Um, although it doesn't quite have um, uh, the height of it that we might expect. Um, and that could be for practicality, for expense, for any number of reasons, or simply because it's hard, really hard to get an idea of how this would look without the actual undergarments um, underneath. Uh, but it is from that time period where um, the, uh, the, the bustle at the back really was, uh, was known as a shelf bustle, and it would be very, very prominent. Um, until towards the end of the 1800s where it sort of faded again and it was replaced by really just a bustle pad. Um, and so that was really just a piece of padded material that would be worn around the waist really to just sort of soften um, the way that it was hanging here. It wouldn't be quite as um, a dramatic a silhouette. And there are a couple other aspects of this dress which are reminiscent of a bit of a later time period towards the end of the 1880s rather than the beginning. Um, one is the beautiful black lace that is at the front um, and around the collar and the sleeves of the dress. This black lace was part of a trend that was very, very popular at the time um, called uh, Chantilly Black Lace. Um, and one of its most popular uses was actually to have um, a gown of one solid color underneath and have an overlay of the Chantilly Lace. You can imagine that would probably be very expensive. Um, and in some cases, if you have a perfectly good dress, maybe from a plaid that was very popular in the 1870s, um, you might want to update it a little bit with something like black lace. I don't know for sure that that is what happened here. It may have come like this, uh, but this black lace is very um, uh, reminiscent of that time period. It's a great example of it, of, of that popularity, because this was something one could do. They could have a dress that dated from an earlier period, um, and they could get small amounts of black lace to just update it and bring in um, those kind of splashes of uh, a more modern sensibility um, and taste, kind of like accessorizing the dress. 
And actually, in a lot of cases, um, lace collars and lace cuffs were detachable from the dress. And so you could have a number of them that you could interchange um, with, the, with the rest of the dress to sort of dress it up or dress it down, or depending on the situation, you might want to, uh, to wear a different, uh, different collar or different sleeve. Um, but that black lace is really a great example of the popularity of that. Um, it also has, as I mentioned, the high standing collar, whereas um, at other periods it was more open, more rounded. Um, and again, you see that changing um, not only by the decade, but really per dress. You know, uh, this the person who had this dress made might have really just preferred that. Um, we do always have to keep in mind personal preference and personal taste when taking a look at dresses like this. Another aspect of the dress that is reminiscent of sort of the silhouettes and fashion to come is the fact that the sleeves at the top, it is a little bit hard to get a sense of it, but they are a little bit puffed. Not as much as you see um, where it's kind of a, a more distinct puff here, but it does have this puffiness. Um, and what we see in the 1890s is the really large puffed sleeves coming into popularity, the leg of mutton sleeves or as I always think of it, the Anne of Green Gables sleeves, because that's, those are the kinds of sleeves that she uh, is, is yearning for in a dress. Um, but it's starting to get a little bit more volume here at the shoulder, um, and so that could also indicate where fashion is gonna be going. Um, and again, in the 1890s, around this time period, bustles become um, almost non-existent, and the silhouette really simplifies in the gown, and the emphasis is brought up to the shoulders. Um, again, without the without all the proper undergarments on the mannequin, it is hard to get a sense of what this silhouette would look like when it was um, on a person and all done up. Um, but it does give us a chance to examine um, some of the details of the dress really nicely. Uh, another uh, sort of thing to keep in mind as we're taking a look at the dress is again, um, this looks like an incredibly tall, uh, tall woman who would be wearing this dress. But again, we do have the mannequin raised so that the dress isn't directly on the floor. And there would have been some bustling going on here and some petticoats underneath, which would um, expand out the dress. So again, I do think she would be taller than me this time, but, um, but probably not by quite as much as, it, as the impression gives here. Now this dress, I know that we're all thinking it because the other dress had it, this dress also has pockets. So along the waistband, similarly to, uh, to the pocket over here, we have a slip pocket in the side and it is actually mostly covered by the ribbon. Um, but again, it would be a perfect place for um, something very practical uh, like a pocket watch. Um, and so that is really what, what's a lot of fun about examining dresses like this, is finding the little details, finding the little things that make it come to life and make you realize that this was truly um, an article of clothing that was worn by someone. Um, it's not just, you know, a piece of clothing that um, has been in a museum for, since its inception, it was worn, used, loved by a person. Um, and that's what I really love about having the chance to do a bit of a deep dive into this dress. So as beautiful as these dresses look on the mannequin and when they're all dressed up, one of the most interesting things that I find is looking at the inner construction of the dress. Um, and you start to see a lot of the practical details that the dressmaker or the owner would have put into the dress to make it more wearable. Um, so of course my favorite aspect is the little uh, pocket for a pocket watch. Um, and we saw that at the front of the gown. So as just a reminder, it's just sewn in right here. And then you can see at the back, um, the little pocket. You can also see these ties here. And so these would help in making sure that the skirt stayed attached either to the undergarments or to the bodice itself to keep them together um, and not have them uh, separate or open or anything like that. You can also see, um, again, the hook and eye closures. So here, 
we have much larger ones that were on than were on the bodice, but that makes sense. It has to support the weight of the of the skirt, um, and this is where they would close. And even um, these devices have been so beautifully attached to the dress. Um, they're really, really gorgeous fasteners. Now, another interesting feature of this particular dress um, is uh, this. And this piece of fabric, it looks at first glance like a pocket. That's certainly what I thought it was at first. Uh, but kind of taking another cursory look and thinking about it, um, it's likely that it was either um, a piece of fabric that would have been um, used to help protect the rest of the fabric of the dress from the wire bustle um, that was underneath, or it could have itself uh, being stuffed with something, horsehair or other padding, um, and sewn up in order to have this sort of um, inner uh, attached uh, bustle. And so you wouldn't have to wear a separate device, um, which definitely would date this to that later 1880s time period, uh, because that is when the bustle pad was much more uh, common, where it was just the small padding um, really just sort of at the small of the back, uh, below the small of the back, that would create some of the shape of the dress, not the really dramatic bustles and trains that you saw um, earlier in the decade and in the previous decade. So this feature, I think, is a particularly interesting aspect of the dress, um, and one that you would never see uh, without actually opening up the dress and seeing how it's constructed. Another feature of the dress that you wouldn't be able to see just by looking at the dress on the mannequin um, is this feature inside here. Uh, and you can see that it does not go all the way around the dress. It's just at the back of the dress. So that's what we're looking at here um, is the back. Uh, and so this is a feature that uh, was sewn into the dress and it would have helped to have the dress hold its shape. Um, so while you're walking, it wouldn't be sort of kicked up behind you. Um, and it would also help the dress to, to sit nicely uh, while you were standing. It may have attached to some of in, to inner workings of something like a, a long bustle um, or a crinolette, uh, but it also could have been a feature of the later style where you have a much more minimal bustle, but you still need to have some structure in your dress uh, to maintain um, a shape uh, and uh, and the way you want it to fall and move as you walk. And so this certainly could, would have helped uh, with that as well. And again, something you would never know was here until we really take the dress off the mannequin uh, and take a look at it. Um, and this is as beautiful as the dress is. It's these features that are just so fascinating um, and helped, uh, helped to really make the dress come to life. So we are here with Rebecca, and Rebecca uh, curated this exhibit. Rebecca, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your role here at the museum? I am uh, currently the curatorial intern at the museum, so I work with our curatorial team to create and research exhibits and then put them together. That's awesome. How far into your term are you? I'm about 80% of the way done. I'm almost finished oh, with my turn. Wow. And, uh, yeah, I've been here since January and I've only got about two weeks left. Oh, only two weeks. Well, we're definitely going to be very sad to uh, to see you go, but we'll have this incredible exhibit here to remind us of you and all of your hard work. So would you like to tell us a little bit about the exhibit, The Origin of Fan? So The Origin of Fan is a deep dive into our collection. We've got over 30 fans in the collection from 1870 to present day. And here we've got a collection of fans that are from the 1890s or the Victorian period. So what kind of inspired you to do an exhibit about fans? Well, I was perusing through the collection online, trying to figure out um, what something we hadn't featured in a while would be, and I noticed one fan, which turned into 20 fans, and realized that none of our fans had been on exhibit in many, many years, and we wanted to feature something that hadn't had a chance to come up yet. That's wonderful, and that's a fun way to explore how we use the collection, and how we can sort of take, a, take these opportunities to do deep dives into these very specific topics. Mm -hmm. 
So you have a fan in your hand here. Would you like to tell us about this fan? This is a parasolette fan. So a parasol is a small umbrella used to shield you from the sun. And this fan sort of is the same shape as a parasol, so we call it a parasolette. And it is one that uh, was very popular in the Victorian era. Again, these are from 1870 to 1890. So all of these ones behind here are all parasolettes as well. And they open quite uniquely, just like this. They close all the way shut and then reopen into a full circle, which is pretty cool. That's very cool. Now part of the display um, that is in the, in the hallway in the exhibit that you can come and visit at the museum talks about the language of the fan. Could you show me what that looks like? The Victorians were very discreet people and they liked to talk in code so they had flower language and they had fan language and you would use your fan to communicate with people without saying anything. So something uh, that they would use it for. If you tap your right cheek, that means yes, and if you tap your left cheek with a closed fan, it means no. Oh, very cool! So you can send those secret messages to a secret admirer and no one around you will know. Exactly. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for taking a moment to talk to us about fans. These fans are absolutely stunning, so you can 100% imagine uh, a lady in Guelph in the 1870s, 1880s, wearing one of the dresses that we have taken a look at and using one of these beautiful fans as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and hopefully everyone will get a chance to come down to the museum and take a look at all the fans. This means goodbye. <laughs>